Hello and welcome to this very first panel here on ModCon 2020. I am so pleased to have you all here uh, watching us and to have my wonderful guests for this amazing series of panels we're going to be going through this Friday, the first day of this three-day convention. So I hope you have got supplies ready. I've got some great, great, great guests. I've been watching chat. You know who they are, but we're going to go through it anyway because, you know, they might be some people who don't know who these lovely wonderful people are and we'll then get an opportunity to learn from them so i'm not going to start in any particular order um i'm just going to start the first person i see and the first person that i see is cody cody welcome thank you thank you for joining us what's up buddy i i have missed hanging out with you on streams uh, it's been like six seven months now uh, oh, oh my god maybe longer maybe longer and uh, i'm thrilled to to be here with monty and kelly and the whole modifius team man i'm really excited about this event so thanks for having me also everyone should know who the dungeon dudes are right i mean come on these guys are <laughs> blowing up absolutely so yes thank you for that lovely segue into the dungeon dudes kelly and monty thank you for joining us this, uh, this afternoon this evening whatever your time zone happens to be in yeah i think uh for thank us, you. it's uh, afternoon here, and yeah, thank you so much. It's it's such a pleasure to be here. Right. Yeah, well, it feels long overdue to get to does. hang out with both of you, guys, both of you fine gentlemen. It does. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. And chat is going, hello, hi, hello, 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 hello. Now, let's get into the main body of it. And um, I'm just going to randomly choose someone to answer this question. So let's uh, let's start with Kelly. Kelly, what was oh. your first GMing experience? Oh man, okay. So uh, actually, so Monty got me into D and D about uh, ten years ago, and my first time running a game is um, as as something that happens a lot in groups of friends is we had a table that was pretty full at Monty's table. But we had about five or six other very close friends that really wanted to play, but we didn't want to run a 10 person table. So I started brainstorming my own ideas and I decided to run a game for some friends. It was, I, I did a one shot that I wrote myself, which was very scary, um, but I did some sort of prison escape campaign um, or one shot mission where I got that group of friends in. And this was, I want to say, about seven years ago or so. And I was playing for several years before then and decided to take the dive into being in the, the hot seat, so to speak. And uh, it was really daunting and scary at first. And there was a lot, uh, a, a lot that I had to try to remember. And I remember all the questions. And I had 20 books in front of me trying to figure out what I was doing it's become much easier in the time since then and you know you get used to it but that was my first dabble was the decision to take on the other section of our friends that wanted to play as well but couldn't join the table at Monty's place fantastic fantastic and you still GM to this day obviously yes yes I do so I have got um yeah I I now like I've I run games other than D&D as well and I, I try to dabble in a few things and I have a home game that's kind of on a hiatus right now because of everything going on um, but I've taken this time to start working on some new ideas for when we come back and I'm very excited I love DMing and I love playing so I try to do as much of both as I can there you go fantastic Cody I've got to ask you what was your first GM experience? Oh gosh, my first, okay. Well, I thought you were gonna say first game experience. Uh, first time behind the screen mm -hmm. probably would have been uh, second edition advanced back in the Thaco days or Thaco or however you wanna say. I always call it Thaco. Uh, when, you know, having that sweet negative four armor class was just ah, so good. Uh, and, you know, you couldn't run out of spells uh, with your wizard or you were, you were left with the crossbow. Uh, so that was probably my, my first experience there. Uh, that must have been, oh God, nine, 10 years old or so with, uh, with Chad Brown and Danny Ely and my buddies down the street and their big brother Clay. Uh, so that's, that, that sort of advanced into high school a little bit with third edition. I was, we were talking to Monty and Kelly beforehand, and uh, uh, I didn't realize we were 
we're all like almost the exact same age. Uh, so uh, you have a lot of experience with, with third edition. I, I as well walked into uh, Generation X Comics over here in Euless, Texas, and they were uh, uh, they were like, you got to buy third edition. You got you got you can't play second edition. What's that nonsense? You got yeah. This this is what you need to play. Monks are awesome, and um, and so we uh, uh, yeah doing a lot of that with with my buddies in in high school at that point. But you know in my house. D and D was the devil, so I had to sort of like hide it and sneak it and and go over to my buddies' houses and and play. And uh, uh, I couldn't let my dad uh, catch my books, or or they would end up in the trash. So, a uh, lot of fun, man, a lot of fun. And did you ever look back from being a GM? I I I have a control issue. <laughs> I will freely admit that. Um, I'm a backseat dungeon master when I'm a player. And so I, you know, embrace it, right. Embrace it. Be like, this is, this is who I am. And, uh, so I, I don't, I don't think I really ever have, I've played in very few campaigns. Uh, actually I got to play in one of your campaigns, which, uh, can I say for everybody here, if you guys have not seen guy actually behind the screen, one of the absolute top notch game masters in the world, period, period. I, I don't have any proof to back that up, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I, yeah, your, 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 your check's in the mail. Um, Monty, I saw you nodding when, when there was the mention of Control Freak and backseat GMing. What, what was your first experience like? Were you sort of wresting control from some poor soul? You know, back in the dark days of high school, um, I it was in, in 2000, I was working my very first summer job and up the street for me in the small town I grew up in was this magical bookstore that was stocked wall to wall with every fantasy book you can imagine. And the owner of that bookshop knew that I was into Warhammer, knew that I was into fantasy, always gave me great recommendations. And I'd heard of D&D through like my interest in Warhammer. I got into uh, tabletop war games by stumbling into a games workshop. And the owner was like, "You sh they, these just came in. Here's third edition D and D. You should try this. And so, uh, a really good buddy of mine uh, that I was growing up with, uh, my friend Jesse, I got him into it. We got a couple of the other people that were playing Warhammer with, and a few other friends in our social group into it, um, and played a ton of D and D through high school, mm. uh, growing up. Um, and you know, throwing D and D into the mix of all the high school social issues that happen is a bit of a recipe for disaster. I have a very visceral memory of posting on the old Wizards of the Coast forums about the problems my group was experiencing. And the first comment was, you sound like a bunch of high school kids. <laughs> that was me, I'm sorry. Uh... <laughs> uh, because, because like we had all that high school social drama around right. the game right because there was there was just all that like layering playing D D on top of the, that environment i think for a lot of young people getting into D D, it's it's surprising how much those social layers bleed over top of each other where i had friends that literally they wanted to have duels with each other's characters because they were jealous over who got a date right like <laughs> no it's okay I, we feel you we feel you <laughs> Yeah, at least your friends were cool enough to actually have dates going on in high school. We never had that problem. But um, <laughs> uh, right, so there we go. We got some questions from chat, which I'm going to take before we move on to the next thing. Um, and so um, there's there's some questions that I might skip um, due to to uh, the PG-13 rating. Um, some of them uh, are interesting. So. Um, Akdokan asks, what games are you playing right now during the pandemic? Um, yeah, start with, with you, Cody. What are you playing right now? Uh, I am running uh, two campaigns, one of which I love and one of which I don't. Um, <laughs> um, I'm running, uh, actually running two campaigns for patrons at the moment. And okay. my players are all fantastic, wonderful, wonderful players. I have one, play, uh, one game that is uh, actually finishing up this Tuesday for uh, Storm King's Thunder. This is my second time through on this campaign, which is a weird, weird experience to run the same campaign twice, but we, they took a vote. That's what they wanted to run. And uh, that was an interesting experience. It's been a, a wonderful uh, uh, game there. The Pathfinder 2E game, I'm playing uh, Age of Ashes on the same day. So I, I play like Age of Ashes, Pathfinder, go pick up my kid from school, come home, say hello to the wife, and then play... 5e and playing the two systems on the same day has been 
uh, there's been a lot of cognitive dissonance when it comes to, hey, give me an investigation role. You mean perception? Sure, whatever they're calling it in this edition. Uh, <laughs> edition confusion has been, uh, has been very serious going from Pathfinder 2E to, fi to 5E after five or six other editions of a version of the D20, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Starfinder, Absolutely. Pathfinder, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And 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 Monty, what are you are, are you guys playing games together or, or or do you have your own separate games as well? Yeah. Yeah, so we have our live stream campaign that we do on Tuesday nights, which is uh Shadows of Dragonheim, our season two of our our live stream show. So I run that game, Kelly plays in it. Um and for myself, uh I've been running Every two weeks, I have uh, my partner and uh, some of uh, and uh, her brother and some of our other friends. I've been r running uh, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden for them. Mm -hmm. So we just started that. We're about three, three or four sessions in there. Um, and beyond that, it's it's a lot of other video games. We we had Kelly and I had our Sunday night game with some other some of our other friends that uh, had been going strong for about eight years, but. Um, we had the double whammy of uh, people buying yeah. houses, people having babies, and then a global healthcare crisis. So that that's been on hiatus. Yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've <laughs> never moved ever, right? <laughs> I've never moved. No, absolutely not. Absolutely. Um, well, I haven't moved this month, so you know, to start. <laughs> uh oh, that's lovely that's lovely um okay uh right so so uh so, kelly are you playing anything else other than that i mean it's, it sounds like you guys got a pretty full schedule already anyway yeah i i try to mix in a little bit of um i i'm trying out some other rpgs so i've been mixing in a little bit of monster of the week and right mm -hmm. now i'm in the process of learning the uh the alien rpg uh, which is in the background there. I uh, haven't ran a game of it yet, but I've been reading through the rule books and I'm excited to start trying that out. And so those are kind of the other games I've been running other than participating in a few D&D games. One, obviously our live stream. And I've also been dabbling in, uh, one of my friends is running Descent into Avernus digitally. And so me and a few friends have joined in on that as well. Um, but yeah, other than that, pretty pretty blocked out schedule with uh, all the Drakenheim stuff that we've been doing. Right, absolutely. Yeah. I think we're gonna get a game of the Quiet Year in sometime if we if we can. We're really excited to play that. So that we, I just played that with my partner, and I'm gonna right. Kelly. We're we're gonna try to get the, a game of that going with Kelly and I as well. There you go. There you go. Okay. I let's. Uh, that was a question from chat. So I'm gonna take another official question. And so here we go. What is? And this is just one of one thing. What would? What do you wish you knew? before you started as a GM about the rules. So if there was one thing before you started GMing, you can sit down with a new GM and say, listen, this is what you need to know about the rules for whatever system you're playing. What would it be, Monty? I think I would start by saying the rules are both more important than you think they are and way less important than you think they are at the same time. Um, there are so many ways in which you have to learn your judgment over when to ignore the rules and when to use them. But the, the way that I would say it is that a dungeon master should look at the rules like a paintbrush or a set of tools. These are the paints and the paintbrushes that you are going to use to express your campaign with and they are there to serve you, first and foremost. Um, the rules aren't your enemy. Um, they are there to help you. And so the, the, the element of knowing when to use them, when to not, and how not to use them is the hardest thing to learn, at least for me as a, as, as a new GM. And it feeds into this idea that, you know, a painter, painters for did never have to make a realistic painting. They can, and there's some beautiful painters, but then you get people like Picasso. But Picasso still knew a lot about how paints work. <laughs> yes. um, and so a, and 
you get brilliant musicians that know how their musical instruments work. They break all the rules, but they are still masters of those instruments. And so understand that the rules are a tool, they're an instrument, they're there to be your tool of expression. And there, there's kind of this, um, I, I love that meme of, you know, um, Captain Barbarossa saying the rules are merely guidelines. And I disagree with that meme. I think the rules are tools. They, they are yours and you are the master of them and you get to decide what they do. Make them your tool, make them your instrument and they will never let you down. And you, you get to know when to set them down. Interesting. I do kind of want you to say your opening phrase as a wise sensei, kind of <laughs> the rules are important, but they're also not important because that felt very mystical. I kind of, you know, it, it, yeah. that was brilliant. That was great. <laughs> uh cody what would what would you what would you say to yourself i mean obviously i agree with all of those things and i think that that comes with wisdom and experience um and it's it's almost like one of those it's ten thousand hours man you just yeah. people ask me how do i get better how do i get better do it more uh you know I, there's not a magic bullet dm and then you'll be like oh that sucks i'll do better next time uh so yeah all those things when it comes to to the rules i think that absolutely uh Monty just hit the nail on the head um i tell you what there is one thing that i think uh could be a little more technical and it doesn't matter what system you're playing uh one thing that i would advise dungeon masters or game masters or whatever you want to call them to do is to to learn and really master any of the specific combat basics for any system you are running if you it doesn't you don't have to know hey, you can do this jump check it and you get 15 times the weight of whatever your bulk. Okay, you don't need to know that. That's fine. You can look those up or you can make it up or whatever you want to do. But if you are so good at the basics of here's the, here's the mechanics. If you make a ranged attack and you're standing next to somebody, I know that that's X modifier or that's disadvantage in this system or it's totally allowed in this system. If you master those very fundamental basics of your combat system, and then you can focus on what the spells do and what the tools do and how skills work compared with the tool set or not a tool set and how to set DCs and do all those other things. There's a lot of other, a lot of stuff that can go into, into being a dungeon master and learning it. But what I would recommend, especially since we're debuting a new, uh, a new system here this weekend at ModCon, um, you know, master and learn and look over and relearn and then relearn those very fundamental basics of what the actions are, what a full round action is if you're playing, if you're playing uh, you know, one of those older systems or, or whatever. Uh, and that'll go a really long way to at least letting you fake it uh, the, <laughs> for, those, for those first few, few bits and first few sessions with your group. So if you can master those fundamentals, the rest will come. There you go. There you go. Kelly, anything to add? You know, it's hard act to follow. Uh, both of you guys had a lot of amazing advice to say. Um, so I do want to echo that advice. And uh, I will add a little bit to it. I do want to say that I, I think it's important to, um, I'm going to quote one of my film school teachers. Now, I was told by a fan once that this quote doesn't apply to all professions, and it doesn't. Uh, it was specifically a film school teacher, but it also applies to D&D. And their advice to me was, you learn the rules so that you know how to break them properly. And there is a difference between just breaking rules or understanding how you're breaking the rules. And d and is giving you every, or not d and but whatever system it is that you're getting into, the rule book is there for you to understand and learn from. And I, I, my big recommendation is read it. Don't skim through it, but actually read it because something happens when you read through it. And not only is it giving you bits of rules, but you start to understand the flow of how those rules work together. And understanding the flow of a game I think is more important than understanding the rules, which kind of leads me to another major point is don't kick yourself when you're getting started with a new system for not getting the rules right. It's very important. I did this all the time. I would run a session. I would mess up a million things. And afterwards I would sit there and go, 
man, that was a bad game. I wonder if my players had fun. Probably not because I was so bad. Turns out they all had a great time and I was just beating myself up for nothing. So by understanding the flow of a game, by reading the rules, you then can start to rely on the flow that you get to know rather than trying to memorize everything. And then you can make judgment calls on the go that feel, even if you're incorrect in the moment, they feel like they're still keeping the game going. And to me, that's a really important part. So don't beat yourself up on not memorizing everything. Try to get the general idea of how the game's supposed to work and push forward when you're playing. And don't beat yourself up if you get a few things wrong. Come back to it later and let everybody know, hey, I got this wrong last time. Here's how it actually works. And let's keep going. Yeah, so, so that that was such good advice. Can I just steal that and put that in my video and just say it was it was mine? <laughs> Learn the rules, yeah, sure. how to break them. Okay, that's no, I, I came up with that, not not Kelly. Yeah, uh, like, I heard this on a show once. <laughs> it was really good advice. I don't remember who said it, but I'm saying it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that last thing I can weigh in on there, and it, it literally is taken from what you were saying, uh, Kelly, is that when you come when it comes to rules. I read all the books you can and find rule systems that speak to your style. Um, I don't know. How, I think I must have played about six different rule systems this year, at least six different rule systems. And they're all good in, in their own kind of way, but only a few of them kind of go, oh, I actually want to play more of this. And it's, and it's because the rules just, you can just, they kind of feel right as opposed to other ones where it's like, oh, it's, but technical, it's a bit this, or it's a bit that. And anyway, all right, that that was a uh, that was that was mind blowing uh, answers. So thank you, thanks, chat. Um, another fan question, another viewer question is um, right. Okay, so we've done that one. So little dragon on lil, little dragon, li <clears throat> little <laughs> dragon on lil. Uh, there careful, we go. Be careful. Uh, <laughs> We have two problems. One, A, I can't read. B, I can't really see the question because it's such a small thing. Uh, I'm afraid I moved my campaign too far into the story too fast, and I don't know how to slow it down. Any tips? If the speed, if the bus goes under 76 miles per hour, we're all going to die. I'll, 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 I'll per... jump in here if, if, if you guys want. Um, okay, this is... I. I... I talk to people because I do a, a patron tier where people talk to me. So I, I get a lot of like very direct 30 minute sessions with, with new, new dungeon masters. And I get asked a lot of questions very similar to this. Mm. And oftentimes I will, I, I want to bring up to, to this individual and something I would, I would pose back to the person who asked this question is how big of a problem is it? And who is it a problem for? Because a lot of times I'll get asked these questions from dungeon masters. So well, I did this and it's, it's a problem. And I, okay, well, is it a, really a problem? Is it genuinely really a big problem or is it just maybe kind of irk you a little bit? And it's okay if you're like, well, it irks me and I would like to address it, then fine. But I would maybe take a step back and say, okay, great. My story's progressing quickly, but is that a problem? Is that really, okay, what happens if you give your players another level and you add a little bit of a side quest to it to pace out the game sessions a little bit more? Is that going to ruin anything if you, if you, just kind of go with it or if you really really hunker down and try to slow everything down is that going to improve the game so before you and i think it kind of even touches a little bit on what kelly was just saying about beating yourself up uh sometimes it's okay so um that i know that's not a, a great answer of here's exactly how to slow your campaign down but uh but maybe maybe just take a step back and assess and see if it really is the problem you think it is or if it's maybe just not what you predicted the pacing of the campaign to be. That would be my, my little bit of advice there. Monty, yeah. Kelly, any thoughts? Um, I'll, I'll say that like the, the, the speed and pacing of the game is something that can be uh, difficult to grasp, especially uh, early on. And I do agree with you that, you know, I, I would kind of, uh, speed through certain things and slow down at certain things and my players never noticed or complained about it so it is important to know like who is the issue for if it's for you or if it's for the whole table if it is an issue that either you yourself or the whole table is having um i i don't see anything wrong with adding like if you have an idea on where the story's going 
um, add some downtime, reassess the situation and ask it, depending on the game you're playing, like get ideas on what the players and their characters are interested in. And that will actually help you flesh out more things to do in your world. If your quest is to go steal a treasure from the mountain, but one of your characters has an interesting backstory that involves diplomacy in another city nearby, that might be a whole side quest that is interesting to the player characters. And I, I think there's a lot of ways that by listening to your players, you can actually flesh out more of your world. That's just one example, but but like the whole idea is your players have great ideas and they want to participate as well. And most of these games are shared storytelling. So if you're thinking that you're moving too quickly, listen to what everybody else wants to tell in their stories and build off of that. Yeah. Monty? My my question would be, does your villain think, does your antagonist think things are moving too quickly? Because if your antagonist thinks th things are moving too quickly, then your antagonist can say, oh, uh oh, I've overplayed my hand. I need to retreat. I need to uh, assemble allies. I need to go into hiding. But if, they, if your antagonist thinks that, no, this is great, then put the pe pedal down on the, on, on like, then you're metaphorically, put the rock on the gas pedal and give the wheel to your players and see what they do. <laughs> yeah. Make it their, make it your player's problem. Um, the, the things that should be defining the pace of the story and this this can be this is something that, that I've I've learned is either the actions of the villains themselves, which you control, or the actions of the players, which you don't. And those things are two sides of a drum beat that if one side starts banging that drum faster, then the other side has to react. And th and you get control over half of the equation, which mm. is the villain. And if things are moving too fast for the villain, if in how you're role playing them and how you conceptualize them, what would your villain do? If if they're like things aren't ready, they, things are mo moving too quickly. The solar eclipse is not for another six months. You know, it's time to go into hiding. You know, we don't have the necessary ingredients. Then do that uh, and give the reins to the players and see what happens from there. There we go. Great advice. Absolutely great advice. I, 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 I must admit, I didn't realize how sore my neck is going to get throughout these these panels. You guys are, you, I'm just kind of going, yep, yep, that's good advice. Good advice. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Good advice. Absolutely. Uh, correct, correct. And another way of doing it, if you're really, really uncertain as to how to slow your pacing down, is literally to go, right, one adventure is for the main plot, one adventure is for the characters. And that's backstory, or that's a side quest, or it's whatever. And then just stick to that. Just stick to that alternating sort of pattern and, and, and see how that will work. Anyway, great, great question. Um, next question, 10 things, well, not 10 things, things I wish I knew about NPCs before you started GMing. What would you say, Kelly, NPCs? So I used to put a lot of work into my NPCs. I would write out their backstory and history. And uh, this this one's going to be a cliche. Every every GM in the world knows this. And um, I, I wrote out an NPC that was like the commander of some paladin group. And uh, she like had this whole backstory, really interesting. Uh, I put so much work into that. And then I had some guy named, I don't know, Bob who was the farmer nearby and he had a pot of stew and that was his whole role is he was going to serve stew. And he ended up going on adventures with the party and they ended up saving him multiple times. They kept asking him personal questions. They wanted to know more about him. And what I learned is don't put so much effort into your NPCs because you have no idea which ones your characters are going to lash to. And it's usually going to be the one you put the least amount of effort into. And that's that's just the truth of the matter. So make all of them Bob, the guy stirring soup, and you're going to have wacky, crazy adventures. And yeah, I, I write down a, one line about my NPC. Usually I write down an actor or fictional character who would portray them so that I can do a voice. And the trick there is even if you get the voice horribly wrong, nobody knows because it's your NPC. They don't know that you wrote down Arnold Schwarzenegger and you can't do that accent at all so just that's all you really need to go on for an npc and i wish i knew that rather than writing hundreds of notes 
Kelly, uh, Monty, sorry. Echoing what Kelly said, originality is super overrated when it comes to tabletop role-playing games. And don't be ashamed of being derivative, stealing things, and ripping off celebrities, cartoon characters, um, even your favorite politicians or least favorite politicians or other real world figures. Um, it, it works so well. And even when your players do catch you doing an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression, they're going to be delighted for recognizing the pop culture reference rather than calling you out for being unoriginal. Um, in particular, for your home role-playing games, have fun with your NPCs, rely on a shorthand, and you are not, you don't need to put the same amount of effort into one of your NPCs that a screenwriter would, or an actor would put into a character that they're portraying in professional media. At the end of the day, you're playing a game with friends, and uh, as, as, a, as a more, as, as another uh, add on to that, because you're playing a game with friends, don't make fun of people at the table for role playing in funny voices, defend that, make it, a, make it a, an environment where everyone can feel not embarrassed about taking on a silly voice, pretending to be an elf and pretending to be another person. And if you lead that, it will come back to you from your players. I'm, I'm genuinely upset at you, Monty, because I wrote down lean into the tropes as soon as I asked that, because it's totally and absolutely true, right? Uh, you know, I find that oftentimes when you present NPCs that your players can quickly recognize as those little tropes, here's the, you know, the grungy blacksmith and oh, I'll do that for you, you know, blah, blah. Uh, you know, and the, there's the... Uh, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it's, I'm drawing a blank, but there's the, the maiden in distress and here's the, the paper boy and there's the, the haughty prince and all of those things. When you lean into those tropes, your players, they just get that sense of normalcy instead of feeling like I'm in this pretend world inside my dungeon master's mind and trying to figure out the painting mm -hmm. that, that they're trying to paint me. They get it. They get it really quickly yeah. when you lean into those tropes. And so you can keep the story moving and flowing. And uh, to echo what Kelly said, look for ones that they gravitate to. Uh, if they love, you know, the whimsical, oh, it's Fargus. All right, he's having a great time. And, and that's who they love. And they're, they're immediately, every time that NPC comes back, their faces light up. Then keep keep putting that NPC, but, but don't don't think that you're going to be able to kind of even sort of predict the NPCs that uh, uh, that they're going to like. The only other bit of advice I would have about uh, NPCs, things I wish I knew, was, uh, and this is this is relatively new for me, is to give them more traditional names. Uh, you know, John, Bob, you know, Brent, Clark, what William, things like that. FantasyNameGenerators.com is an excellent tool. But sometimes when you're, you know, stumbling through the name yourself, like your players, him. they don't, they don't have a clue. Oh, and, and, and write it down. If you're, in, if your players like an NPC, man, notes, uh, treated them good. They like him. That's it. That's enough. You'll, yeah. you'll <laughs> sounds like uh, William H. Macy. All right. I mean, you know, you move on from it. So those are things that I wish uh, I knew. Uh, Simple so. names with titles is super clutch. Like an yep. NPC with a title like the Red Baron or, you know, the the friendly blacksmith. It just makes them so much more memorable. That's it. And it's, it's, it's literally about that. I, the, the, the one NPC I never anticipated ever in a million years was a god in one of my games that the, the PC sort of spoke to. And the god was a simpleton, absolute simpleton. And there was, of course, that question I saw it in chat where the player went, Oh, so what's your name? And I went, well, his name, he is, and I was doing the usual kind of process. I'm like, well, he's a, he's a lad. He, you know, he's a, he's a young lad and he's a god. And so his name became a lad because um, that's what his dad said when he was born. Oh, look, a lad. Um, and, and, that, I did, and that was it. That was a throwaway NPC. And yet everybody was like, well, we're bringing a lad along with us. So it does happen. I mean, it, it's, it, but go with it. That would be my advice is if the, PC, oh. if the PCs are engaging with your NPCs, don't shut them down. 
go with it let them go on the adventure with them let them explore stuff because we were talking about pacing earlier that npc has a story and maybe whoever it is ferguson or, or whatever needs to go and see their ailing mother and that's now a side quest which is so much more powerful because the, the piece is invested in. anyway all right so next question we still got a little bit of time a little bit of time so short answers Short. Okay, short. We can do that. Cool. I, I know it's difficult for 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 for, for everyone. Um, okay, uh, I'm just trying to find one that could be a possibly short answer. Things I wish I knew about dice. Let's go with uh, who hasn't started. Cody. Uh, make players who you think are cheating roll them in public. Aha! Uh -huh. There we go. That's a short one, Monty. Um, don't spend so much money on them. <laughs> what? No, sh we have too many sponsors. Don't do that. What are you doing? No, my, mine was the opposite. Mine was spent. <laughs> you're, you're starting a, a, an addiction. Know that. That's what you need to know about dice. If you buy a set of dice, it's an addiction. <laughs> I have over, over like 200 sets of dice for no reason. I have eight next to me right here at the table. Yep. Hell, we can be friends. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> To go back on that, uh, make sure that I, actually the other thing would be make sure you buy enough for to have extras for all the dice you're going to lose. And for all the people who don't show up with them. Do you guys still have your yeah. first sets of dice that you ever yes. use? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I do. I have my, my D20 from my first box. That bag so, I was yeah. telling you about earlier that I think was stolen that I bought for five bucks from another guy. I still have that. <laughs> 25 years later or whatever there you go my d20 it's co i it hates me it was the first d20 i bought and it was always against me always even to this day just against me all right so that's dice um let's see another question from the audience we've got so many very good questions coming in here um right so this one should be quite quick uh orange dizzle says if another panel uh, if the other panel members were a monster from we're going to go with Dungeons and Dragons, that's what they stipulate. What would they be? So, Kelly, what would Cody be? Oh, man. Uh, it has to be a monster. So, I can't just say like gladiator or something like that. Nope, Is that kind of no? Um, Can we do it right there. <laughs> a, a big, a big old ogre. Ogre. Uh, there you are. There you are. There you are. Cody, what would Monty be? Uh, Monty would be a flame skull. A flame skull. Ooh. Because he spits that fire on YouTube, man. <laughs> <laughs> Monty, what would Kelly be? Sorry, Kelly, buddy. I, you're I a love goblin. it. I love it. <laughs> I am. <laughs> what was that? I didn't, I didn't catch it. A goblin. A goblin. He's a goblin. <laughs> there you go. All right. Always have been. Okay, a goblin it is. Right, so an ogre, a goblin, uh, and, and a, a flaming, flaming skull. skull. Well, I, that's an I interesting... I think Monty won that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, um, we have run out of time, so I'm going to ask you... I'm going to say thank you so much. It has been super cool. We didn't get through half the questions we were hoping to get through, but that's great because it means we should go and watch all of your channels so we can get those answers in due course. <laughs> so, um, Cody, how and where do people find you? They find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash taking 20, uh, not talking 20, which I have been fighting for forever along with Corey and Kobe and Cody with a T, but uh, it is in fact Cody uh at taking 20 or you can find me on twitter at taking d 20 because somebody somebody had taking 20 and twitter wouldn't they wouldn't give it to me so there you that's go. it <laughs> taking 20 can't miss him cannot miss him and you're releasing videos every week every second oh week? no i release a couple of videos a month i think probably at this rate uh and i appreciate all of the love and support while uh, I've been dealing with some family issues. Uh, uh, my father has cancer and all those things. And so I've been having some, some lovely comments from people, but uh, you know, things, things may turn around in 2021 for, for the pacing, but there's video still, there's They're video still. We just video. talked about Tasha's this week. So <laughs> awesome. absolutely. Absolutely. Kelly Monty, where do we find you guys? 
We are also on YouTube at youtube.com slash Dungeon Dudes. And uh, our Twitter and all that junk has a uh, underscore between Dungeon and the Dudes. Yes. Uh, but not on YouTube. <laughs> we are, we, yeah, everywhere other than YouTube, you can find us at Dungeon underscore Dudes. And we are on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can find us on Facebook as well. And uh, yeah, you can check us out on all those platforms. We upload videos every week, sometimes two a week. And we also have our live play overachievers. <laughs> uh, well, there's there's two of us, and I don't know. Yeah. We 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 have nothing else going on in our lives other than producing <laughs> video content right now <laughs> and, and playing <laughs> and playing D and D. It's it's a it's been a pretty sparse year, so that's all that we do. And yeah, you can also check out our live play, which is Dungeons of Drakenheim or Shadows of Drakenheim, also available on YouTube and uh, streaming on Twitch on Tuesday nights. Although we're taking a break until the new year, so catch us when we come back. There you are. There you are. And um, folks, you can find me on YouTube as well. YouTube.com forward slash how to be a great game master. One long giant sentence because I'm not as cool as these folks are. And um, yes, you can you can take us from there in terms of socials. Now, although this panel is finished, it is not the end, not by a long shot. We've got a lot more coming up. And uh, coming up is Mastering the Basics. That is on the hour. So and that is, I'm your host once again. Sorry, there's nothing you can do about that. But we've got <laughs> Nate from WSD20 joining us, as well as Seth Skorkowski from Seth Skorkowski. So uh, we will be talking about mastering the basics after that next level GM techniques and then the Star Trek Adventures a game that I will be running. Folks thank you so much for joining us and thank you uh, Cody and Monty and Kelly for your insight it was it was wonderful and uh, yes we will be seeing you all around in due course. Mm -hmm.